Welcome back to the channel. Today we have an old build. It's back. I can't keep up. They wreck them faster than I can fix them. At least it's a different side this time. Now, if you want to see what it looked like the last time we rebuilt it, link's up there. This time it doesn't drive, so we're going to need to do a little work just to get it off the trailer. And I don't like to put them on the trailer backwards, but I needed to pick it up from the parking spot it was in and I didn't feel like jockeying it around because, well, it's cold out here. So it is what it is. It made it home. So let's get some suspension on it at the shop where it's nice and warm, get it off the trailer and take a better look at it. So we'll pull our wheel off first so we can see what's wrong in there. Uh, I know at least the drive axle is busted because you know, it makes a lot of noise and doesn't go anywhere. So our control arm's a little wrinkled up in the back. Our inner tie rod end's bent. Our drive axle is Bluetooth. And our strut is giving off some Stance Nation vibes. And since that's the car equivalent of a squatted truck, we need to fix this thing. Disconnect the tie rod end from the knuckle. Put a little pressure on it to hold it into the knuckle. That way you can break it loose. It's amazing the knuckle didn't break. Usually they do, but everything else broke this time. We'll pull the caliper off and hang it out of the way. Pull the rotor off. We can pull the drive axle nut out of it. And we can hammer the drive axle out of the knuckle just to really agitate people because they're afraid I'm going to bend the splines on the axle that's clearly no good. Pull the bolts out of the strut and knock them out of there. They're splined in there, so. Just pulling our drive axle out. Lost that greasy mess in the pile. Hmm, drive axle parts. We'll disconnect our ABS wire. Now we're gonna pull the strut out because it's in our way and it's pretty easy to take out of here. So we'll just unbolt the top of it and drop the whole assembly out of our way. Toss that in a pile. With the strut gone, we have a little more room to get our impact in here so we can unbolt the sway bar link. We'll finish popping off our ABS wire. Put that off to the side before we break it. We're gonna unbolt the back of the control arm. That bolt goes all the way through the subframe. And comes out pretty easy since I just put it in not that long ago. We'll pry our control arm out of here. We didn't have to unbolt the front of it. Uh, they did that in the accident. And they didn't unbolt it. They just broke the end of it right off. That's a first, and I've seen a lot of these broken. And the back of it's a little wrinkled up. Wow. Now we can unbolt the front of the control arm. And take the little nub out of here. And we'll set our new control arm and knuckle back up in there. Looks like we even got a new wheel bearing. Slide it in there, tap it in. And we'll tap, tap, tap a roo. Front one in. Put a bolt in the front so it doesn't end up falling on us when we go underneath it to put the other bolt in. We'll run our bolt through the back, through the subframe. There is a bracket on the back that bolts the subframe up separately, so that's why we can take it out of there. Not to mention the car is sitting on a jack stand, so we don't have to worry about the subframe falling out. A little wiggle and pull, we'll get the rest of our drive axle out, and we can put our new drive axle in. Line up the splines, we have the little C-clip facing down so that it slides in a little easier. And just kind of tap it in there. Make sure it's all the way in. And we put it back in our knuckle. So we want to go in. It's so much easier when it was two pieces. Put a drive axle nut on there. You know it didn't want to go together, but it'll definitely just fall apart. Now we'll slide our new strut up there. The nuts on the studs. And there's one bolt. And then we can tighten it all down. Now 
Now we can put our knuckle into our strut. Tap the bolts in there. And then we don't need a wrench to hold them. Lines will do it for us. Tighten those up. Put our rotor back on. And put this little backing plate. Not sure what it does. It's only on the newer Grand Ams, 2004 and 5, I believe. At least it came with those. Most of them didn't make it back on after their first brake job. Now we'll snug up our drive axle nut. We'll torque it down later. Put my tie rod end back on there. And we need to get our fender out of the way. So we'll pull the bolts out of it. We need to pull the bolts out of the bottom. The bottom of the fender is gone. So we need to get the bolt that's on the top of the fender inside the door. So we'll open up the door. Get that out of there. And we can get the bolts out of the top of the fender. The last two in the back, we have to use the ratchet because they're also the hood hinge bolts and not enough room for the impact. Now we got to pull the hood off. It comes riveted from the factory, so we're going to unrivet it and it will not be riveted back on. They never are. Put a couple bolts in it just to hold the hood so it doesn't fall into the windshield that's not broken yet. Hopefully it remains unbroken for the duration of this repair. No guarantees, but I'll do what I can. There's one more bolt at the bottom and the front, but our fender's a little crammed in there. So we're just gonna pull it out a little bit and get our ratchet in there and unbolt it. And then toss that in the pile. Now we need to carefully remove our wheel liner. Now for a little redneck alignment, we got our tie rod adjusting tool. So this tool works by applying slight repeated pressure to the bent area until it's straight. And I feel the need to say this is only temporary so I can get it off the trailer. But there's always that one guy that thinks I'm gonna send it on down the road like this. Perfect, ship it. We can bolt our sway bar link back in here. And then we'll route our ABS wire through, plug it into our sensor, and then into the control arm. And throw our tire back on. Zip it on, we'll be taking it off again, so. And we'll take it down off the jack, and jack stand. And hopefully, it drives now. The owner redesigned the bumper, but it seems like they kind of didn't finish. So I'm going to finish it up for him. Get rid of this little piece that's hanging off the bottom so that we don't tear the rest of it off when we take it off the trailer. Looks like we're going to need a headlight, headlight mounting panel, bumper absorber, bumper cover. Straighten the edge of that hood and change the fender. Our gap is right on the other fender. Tells us the front end isn't shoved over, hood isn't shoved back, so we should be good to go. No mobile frame rack required. So it's been a few days. Uh, we had a little bit of snow, so now it's time to take the car off the trailer. So Scott's Grand Am Emporium had a fender for us, but unfortunately, like all the other fenders in this area, it's been subjected to the salt weight reduction. So the end of our fender is missing. Most of them you don't even see it because it's underneath the rocker molding. Uh, and this one is no different. The rocker molding actually comes up to like right here. So we're just gonna cut a piece of metal. It's basically just a flat part here and then it has two little slots in it for the bolts. So we're just gonna cut a piece out, put it in here, weld it up, and then we'll be able to mount the bottom of our fender. And it'll probably last as long as the rest of the car and look like this eventually when the rest of the car does. So let's get that done so we can get our fender on our car and 
straighten out our hood. So this fender was listed as an organ donor and it donated a piece so we could put the bottom on our fender so that we can bolt it on. We just ground on the welds and we're gonna paint it like that. No one's gonna see it. Our fender is bolted on. All of our gaps look good, except for this little corner up here. So we're gonna have to fix that. So we have our snap-on hood edge alignment tool. We're gonna put in here and get our hood aligned. So we're just gonna slowly work the hood. We're trying to straighten out the inner piece and the outer piece at the same time, so we don't just wanna hammer the heck out of it. I'm just using a rubber mallet so that hopefully I won't cause too many more dents. Of course, it probably isn't the right hammer, but it works, so it is the right hammer now. Now we'll use our actual body hammer to straighten out the wrinkles that are in there. Now that we got most of it where it belongs. Close our hood and see how it fits. Go down a little bit, a little bit more. So we're gonna use the same method we just used and go a little further. Also have a little bow in the back of the hood, so we need to take that out as well. Pull this corner up and work our way back and get that bow out of there. It's not that I can't do body work, it's just that I hate it. So now our height is right, our gap is right, Gaps right on the door. So we're gonna hand it over to the bodywork gnome and let him finish that up. So our bodywork gnome got the edge of our hood all straightened out, lined up with the fender. So now we're gonna pull the fender and the hood off the car so that they can paint the inside of the hood where the paint was cracked and they can edge out our fender. Normally I would have edged out the fender so I was only putting it on one time, but due to time constraints and everybody's schedule, we had to do it this way. So it's nothing for me to pull this fender back off. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I also have to drill a hole in it, so I'm going to do that. So normally we would just paint the bottom of the hood. We wouldn't need to take it off the car. But because these hoods come off so easy, they're just two bolts in the back, and they don't have to be realigned, uh, we're just going to take it off, make the painter's life a little easier, and hopefully keep him happy. Because if he's happy, I'm happy, because then I don't have to do his work. So we'll just pull the bolts out of the hinges. Somebody put some wiper blades on there are a little too long, so I had to prop them up so we could get in there. Set the latch down on the board. Slide the hood forward just a little bit and take it off. And our paint is cracked right there from where the hood folded down. So we're just gonna sand it out of there, prime it, and paint it. Now we can pull our fender off. Two more bolts this time since they weren't ripped off in the accident, and we have a bottom to our fender. So once upon a time in a land far, far away, actually that's not true, it was in this exact shop. Uh, I made a template because I've done so many of these fenders, I just cut a piece of the fender off and I've saved it over the years. GTs have this little hole in the back, so I just line up the two holes in the front that are in all of the fenders and scribe the hole for the back where our GT fender goes. That way I can use an SE fender or a new fender and I know exactly where the little clip hole is going to go. I don't have to make a tape template or anything. So it took a little time to make that piece of the fender, but it saved me countless hours in the long run. So we drilled out our hole. We're going to hand it over to the painting gnome and let him paint it. And while he's doing that, we're gonna clean all our two-sided tape off of our rocker molding so that we're ready to retape it so it's ready to go back on when our painting is done. We'll use our magic eraser. It does work on plastic. You just need to go a little lighter on the pressure. We had a broken wire for our fog light. It was pretty close, so Scott's Grand Am Emporium had a pigtail, so I just pulled one pin out so that I only had to use one of these heat shrink connectors that the internet hates so much. So only one splice instead of having two. A 
Look, internet, it's gone. Our parts are all edged in, so let's get them on the car so that the painter can paint the outside. So we'll pull the rocker molding back a little bit, slide our fender underneath it. If you're wondering why I left the rocker molding on and didn't just take it off instead of fighting with it, uh, well, the back of it is two-sided taped on, and I don't want to spend the time to clean up the two-sided tape and retape it. So for the few seconds it takes me to try to fight around it, uh, it'll save me a few minutes in the long run. So we'll just leave it alone in the back and fight around it in the front. There are two holes in the bottom of that rocker molding that allow me to get to the fender bolts, so I really don't have to take it off. We're going to get all of our bolts in there. Get them all started. I'm going to line everything up and tighten it down. There's really no adjustment on the top bolts. Our fender's on. Drop our hood in. Slides in between the hinges and then slide it back. Prop up our extra long wiper blade and then put our bolts in and tighten them down. Get the cowl screens out of here. You can actually get a ratchet in there, but it's not worth taking out. We'll just use a ratcheting wrench. So our front end's all back on here. So as soon as I paint the outside, I will throw it all back together. So I'll see you then. So I have a little time because well, I allowed a lot more than I needed to put that fender and hood on. So I think I'll get it ready for the painting though. Even though I hate sanding, I can manage this. Just like gritty toothpaste. Goes pretty quick. But by the time I'm done, I'll hit it again. So. so, we're just using a gray scuff pad with the sanding paste. It puts about 1,200 grit scratches in there. So, we're able to clear right over that. We're just going to sand it all down and give the clear something to stick to. And then we're going to sand the primer with 600 grit. Because it's a silver car, 600 grit is about the coarsest you want to go so you don't see scratches. The rest requires sandpaper and I lost interest, so it's your turn painting gnome. The painting gnome was here, so our grand name is all painted. Let's throw it back together. But first we gotta take what's left of our bumper off here. So I left the bumper on the car because, well, I don't want to have to store all the parts and fasteners and it really wasn't in our way. So we'll pull out the closeout panel, just held in with a bunch of push pins. One push pin on the bottom of the bumper. Unbolt the splash shield on the driver's side. And we can unbolt our bumper from the fender. And pull it off of there. On today's episode of things you don't expect to find and places you don't expect to find them, uh, we're going to find, uh, well, looks like a bird. Or what's left of a bird. Looks like he tweeted his last tweet. Twitter sensors are really getting aggressive these days. They don't just ban you anymore. They unalive you. Now that our work area has been marked safe of rotting carcasses, we can get to the little retainers that hold our headlight in. Just pull them up. You don't have to take them all the way out. The middle one just came all the way out. And we can disconnect our bulbs and take our light out. Now we can unbolt our bumper absorber. What's left of it. In addition to the U-bolts on the outer edges, there's a couple bolts in the center that are just studs that are in the plastic. They're not that easy to get to when the radiator is in the way, so we'll just use a ratcheting wrench on those. And they do tend to rust up. A lot of times they'll break out of the plastic, so sometimes they don't go back in there. These come out pretty easy because, well, somebody's been here before recently. Now we'll take our fog light off before we end up breaking it off of here. They're pretty fragile. And we can get to our last two nuts for our U-bolt. And our energy absorber is ready to come off. Now we can unbolt our headlight mounting panel. Pull the little Christmas tree out of there that holds that front baffle in. And there's four bolts across the top. And there's two bolts on the bottom. There's 
pull the rest of our headlight out of this side so we can disconnect the wiring harness. The wiring harness is actually shoved through the headlight mounting panel. So now we can disconnect all of our clips that hold the wiring harness onto the headlight mounting panel. Use our trim clip pliers for that because I'm too lazy to walk and get a screwdriver. And we'll use our fingers for the rest. Just squeeze the tabs on the outside. That way we don't break them. If we just pry them out, they're not going to survive. Work our way across and toss that in the pile. And we have our brand new aftermarket headlight mounting panel. These things are pretty hit or miss. They either fit just like the factory or they fit horribly. We'll see which one this one is. Once upon a time before they made aftermarkets, I used to actually piece broken ones together because new ones were like $300 and used ones didn't exist. But now that they make aftermarkets, we'll just do that. It's a lot easier. We'll bolt our energy absorber back up here. Turn it down. And I managed to find a semi-deep socket so I could get it in there. Because it's a stud, a shallow one doesn't work and a deep one is too deep. So now we can bolt our fog lights back on and plug them in. Put the fog light on the passenger side. And I don't think this bulb is going to work. Hopefully the one that's in the light does. We'll plug it in and find out. We can put our headlight back in. Flip it in. Make sure that, that bottom one is in, otherwise you end up with Grand Am headlights staring up at the squirrels in the trees. And that's usually because that bottom tab on the outside, somebody didn't engage it all the way. Now we're ready to put our bumper up here. Slide it over our headlight mounting panel. Flip it into the fenders and start bolting it up to our fenders. There's a little bit of adjustment on there. So push it back and then push it in. Get the gap's nice. Put our fender liner back on. And we can put our closeout panel up on the top. It goes under the bumper. That is one of my biggest pet peeves. I don't know why, because it really doesn't matter. It does go underneath the bumper. Tuck it under the fender. And then we can put all our little push pins back in. Now because it's a fancy GT, we got these black moldings we need to put in our bumper. Start at the center, line it up at the edge, stick it on. Just peel the backing as you work your way around. Then when you get to the end, it just tucks into the bumper cover. It's actually a little bit longer, which is nice. When it shrinks, it doesn't pull away, unlike the dashboards and Grand Dams. Although this one is still holding tight from a year ago when I fixed it. Make sure you throw the plastic on the ground so that the shop seals and sea turtles have something to play with. Before you guys give me a hard time about my gloves, there's a lot of drive axle grease all over the place and I don't want to make a mess out of my hands. Besides, I just got off my shift at Subway. YouTube doesn't pay as good as you guys think it does. So we're going to change our tie rod ends. Got to film it or you guys will accuse me of just straightening it out and sending it down the road. Unbolt our tie rod end, tap it out of the knuckle. And we got a little ahead of ourselves. We're going to put it back in the knuckle and we'll put the nut back on a little bit. We need to break our jam nut loose. A lot easier to do when it's held up on one side. So once we broke it loose, we can pull the nut back off of there and we'll spin our tie rod end off. We'll count the turns, even though it isn't going to matter because we're changing both the inner and outer tie rod end, but maybe it'll get us close, but I doubt it. That's the alignment guy's job anyway. So to spin the jamming it off, we'll just spin it off with an impact. 
I just can't seem to get away from spring clamps. So we'll pull the one off that holds the end of the boot on. And then we'll open up the clamp on the inside with a screwdriver. And then a lot of wiggle and pull. And we'll pull the boot off of there. And we can get our inner tie rod end tool in there. These are available in my Amazon store. I'm not a big fan of inner tie rod jobs, probably because they're so awkward. So we got the little wrench end on there. We engage it in the tool. And pray that it doesn't fall out of there. We got to do it all over again. Very awkward. Break it loose. And once it starts spinning, we can take all this off of here. And spin it out by hand. It's not that bent. Yeah, it's straight. So we'll put our new one in there. No Loctite needed on these. You smash the ends over, that locks them in place. So we'll spin it on there. They pretty much go all the way on because there is no Loctite in there. Put our little wrench end on there. Slide the rest of our tie rod end tool over it. got to make the inner tie rod end face or this all goes wrong. Now we'll tighten it down. We're going to use the German Torque Specs good and tight. Click. And we'll pull the rest of our wrench out of there. And we'll turn the wheels the other way so we can get to the end of this. And we'll smash the end over it to lock it in place. It's just a chisel. I'm just going to flatten the end over. I do both sides just for safety and to make it harder on the next guy, I guess. Now we can put our boot back on. Slide it on there. Make sure you put your spring clamp on because that's kind of like when you flare lines and forget to put the fitting on. It's pretty much the same thing, except that you can go back on this. Now we'll put our jam nut on. And we'll squeeze the clamp on the other side and we'll put our tie rod end on. It did coat it in Never Cease to be nice to the next guy. We're going to screw down the same number of turns as our old one and find out that the alignment is way off. So we're just going to have to eyeball it until we can get it over for an alignment. Drop the tie rod end down in the knuckle. And spin our jam nut back. Put a little more mechanics glitter in there. Be nice to the next guy. Which, at the rate this car is going, will definitely be me. So, I'm being nice to myself. We'll spin our jam nut over our freshly never seized tie rod end. Sure, I wear gloves for the rest of this job and take them off for when I got the never seize all over my fingers. So we'll spread it all over every part of the car and for the rest of the job. We'll put the nut back on the tie rod end. This one uses a washer behind it to space the castle nut out so that the hole in the tie rod end lines up with the castle nut so that the cotter pin engages with the castle nut. Slide our cotter pin in there and bend it over. And we'll use a screwdriver to bend the other side over at 90 degrees to make sure it's not coming out of there. And I'm sure somebody will tell me I did it wrong. It appears that while this car was sitting, Rocky the Squirrel or Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse got in here and chewed up our vehicle speed sensor wire. Now the broken wire was bad enough, but they chewed the back of the plug too. So there was no way to repair it. So I just spliced in another one and used a heat shrink connector. And I won't show you that. So the internet doesn't have to be all upset about it. So we'll put our molding back on our bumper. 
on the other side. We had to go over to Scotch Grandium Emporium to pick this up. That's why we had a little gap in between. But now we're going to do all the sticky stuff. Make sure it's on there. Get to the end. Tuck it into the bumper. And push it on there. It does help if you heat them up, especially winters in Chicago. There's a lot of heating going on. Now we can put our clip in the back of our rocker molding. That'll go into the hole we drilled. We'll pull the backing off our two-sided tape. And the bottom of the rocker molding is a little smashed, but hopefully nobody will notice. Finding one that's not destroyed in the junkyard is pretty much impossible, so this one will work. You want to line up the holes in the edge of it, and then stick it on. If you stick it on and the holes aren't lined up in the wheel well, it makes putting these little plastic clips in a lot harder. So that's our main concern, make sure those are in the right spot. Pop all of our little clips in there, and on to the next sticky thing. We didn't let everybody know this is a Ram Air V6. So we'll use our precise measuring alignment system. I was literally made to fix these cars. It's two of my fingers spaced that out perfectly. Yeah, it looks about right. And on to the next sticky thing. The pinstripe. You thought that was a fad that died many decades ago? Well, nope, there's still some people trying to keep it alive. So we're gonna put it back on because taking the old pinstripe off the rest of this car would probably leave a residue or a shadow of a pinstripe. So it's not worth taking it all off. We're just gonna put it back on. Now, the reason that they put pinstripes on is not to make the car look better. It's to make extra money. Dealers charge like $500 for this. So I'll tell you how it works. There's a guy that comes around to new car dealers and he offers to pinstripe the cars. It takes him about 15 minutes per car and he charges about $200. He'll do anywhere from 10 to 20 cars every time he shows up. So you do the math. He makes quite a bit of money. The dealer doesn't care. The dealer doesn't even tell him which ones to do. They just randomly show up and pinstripe it. And then he walks in the office and says, hey, pay me for this. These are the cars that I striped. And the $200 that they paid him, they mark up your car $500 and sell it to you. So it took him only 15 minutes per car, but it took them zero minutes per car. And they're actually making more than he is. So that's where the pinstripes came from. If you like the way they look, great. Are they worth $500? Absolutely not. And they're pretty easy to install. You just find a body line and follow it. Cut the ends off, peel the coating over the top off, make sure that they're stuck on there. And then when you get to the end, we're going to, well, make this side match, but you can pretty much do whatever you want. So on this one, the top stripe is cut flat, and the bottom one just goes up to meet it, kind of makes a point at the end. So we're just going to duplicate what's on the other side. We can't be too creative unless we want to redo the other side. So we'll peel it up a little bit. And put it down over the other stripe. And yes, the stripes can go over each other. And cut the end of it off. You just got to be careful to make sure you don't peel the stripe up when you're trying to take the backing off or the covering, I guess. The backing's already off. Make sure it's on there. And we'll trim the end a little bit more. That's it. Looks just like the other side. And if it doesn't, too bad. 
can't look at both sides at the same time. So I did a little checking on my paperwork and this car made it 5,000 miles since our last rebuild. So it's not quite as bad as 2,000. It's nice and clean, ready to go. And before you guys give the painting gnome a hard time, the shadows on the hood are actually from the trees up above. That's not a paint problem. The real blame should lie on the camera guy that picked the worst possible place to put the car. Really, 20 feet over would have been better. And the top of our dash is still holding strong. And it's been a little over a year, actually, since this was done. So our Grand Am is all finished. Well, it's done, it's ready to deliver. Now, normally I would have blended the door and the fender on the other side, but the owner was more concerned about price than they were about it looking absolutely perfect. So I give the owner what they want, save them a couple bucks. Maybe next time we'll blend it all, next time we fix it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you soon. I don't ever smoke up, no I don't teach. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement.